Our book today is The Poisoned City, Flint's Water and the American Urban Tragedy by Anna Clark. This is from the prologue. On a hot day in the summer of 2014 in the Civic Park, neighborhood uh, where, excuse me, in the Civic Park neighborhood where Pastor R. Sherman McCathern preached in Flint, Michigan, water rushed out of a couple of fire hydrants. Puddles formed on the dry grass and splashed the skin of the delighted kids who ran through it. But the spray looked strange. The water was coming out dark as coffee for hours, McCathern remembered. The shock of it caught in his throat. Something is wrong here. Something had been wrong for months. That spring, Flint, under the direction of state officials, <coughs> excuse me, turned off the darkening water that it had relied on for nearly, or excuse me, the drinking water that it had relied on for nearly 50 years. The city planned to join a new regional system called the Karagnondi Water Authority. And while it waited for the KWA to be built, it began bringing in its water from the Flint River. McCathern didn't pay much attention to the politicking around all this. He had enough to worry about, about uh, with his busy parish. But after the switch, many of his neighbors grew alarmed at the water that flowed from their kitchen faucets and shower heads. They packed public meetings, wrote questioning letters, and protested at City Hall. They filled clear plastic bottles in their taps to show how the water looked brown or orange and sometimes had particulates floating in it. Showering seemed to be connected with skin rashes and hair loss. The water smelled foul. A sip of it put the taste of a cold metal coin on your tongue. But the authorities said everything was all right and you could drink it, so people did, McCathern said later. Residents were advised to run their faucets for a few minutes before using the water to get a clean flow. But as the months went by, the city plant tinkered with treatment and issued a few boil water advisories. State of, uh, environmental officials said again and again that there was nothing to worry about. The water was just fine. Whatever their senses told them, whatever the whispers around town, whatever Flint's troubled history with powerful institutions telling them what was best for them, this wasn't actually hard for people like McCathern to believe. Public water systems are one of this country's most heroic accomplishments, a feat so successful that it's almost invisible. By making it a commonplace for clean water to be delivered to homes, businesses, and schools, we have saved untold lives from what today sound like antiquated diseases in a Charles Dickens novel, cholera, dysentery, typhoid fever. Here in Flint, it was instrumental in turning General Motors, founded in 1908 in Vehicle City, as the town was known, into a global economic giant. The advancing underground network of pipes defined the growing city and its metropolitan region, which boasted of being home to one of the strongest middle classes in the entire United States. McCathern is a tall, bald man with a thin mustache and a scratchy rasp in his baritone voice. At the time of the water switch, he had led the non-denominational Joy Tabernacle Church for about 15 years. It was founded in the YMCA in downtown Flint, where it held baptisms in the swimming pool. But in 2009, it made a home in Civic Park, where a Presbyterian church closed after 85 years and gave its sanctuary over to the young and hopeful congregation. By then, Civic Park, one of America's oldest subdivisions, was a desert of deserted, historically significant homes, the pastor said. Built between 1917 and 1919 by General Motors and DuPont and Company, along curving tree-lined boulevards, the tidy houses were designed for Flint's auto workers and their families. But over the years, the neighborhood was blighted by vacancy. Empty two stories with lurching front porches and crumbling roofs sat alongside crispy, crisply painted homes where Flint residents, they sometimes called themselves Flintoids or Flintstones, still lived their lives. When the sound of gunshots on the street outside interrupted services, McCathern gave a nod to the church musicians, urging them to play louder. Some called Joy Tabernacle a thug church, he said, but McCathern saw the good. The young men filling his pews built a proud society, if not by getting their names on the honor roll, then by tagging their names with spray paint. In the end, people just want to be seen. The ghosts of the past went well beyond Civic Park. Between General Motors and the United Auto Workers, the city had been a flourishing hub for American innovation. There were more than 100 different manufacturing establishments in town. Ten of them employed at least 1,000 people each. And they not only made automobiles, but paints, varnishes, tools, dyes, cotton, textiles, and a wealth of other products. Flint had one of the highest per, per capita incomes in the entire nation, 
and despite being severely segregated, it was a magnet for African-American migrants from the South. When Vice President Hubert Humphrey stopped by during the campaign for the 1964 presidential election, he praised Flint for, quote, zooming ahead with unbelievable growth and progress. Workers earned wages that are very good, Humphrey said, and, quote, because of the great labor management program in the community over many years, there has been a constant rise in the standard of living, end quote. Away from the assembly lines and the executive suites, the people of Flint felt that the city just shouldn't be a place to work, it should also be a place to thrive. Charles Stuart Mott, an auto pioneer who became GM's single largest stockholder and three-term mayor, created a nationally renowned community, of schools, a community schools program that provided education, skills building workshops, and social influence, and social services. Five. The book, The Poison City. 